viewers today we will try to understand a major literary work written by alexander pope alexander pope belonged to augustan age he was the only poet who dominated the major period of 18th century he shot to fame through satirical verse and his translation of homo he was born on 21st may 1688 in london into a roman catholic family now let's try to know what kind of a child alexander pope was he was a sickly child nestling a lonely spirit an acute attack of tuberculosis crippled him with a hunchback books were the only source of happiness and knowledge and they delighted him to the core pope was a roman catholic and this became a major hindrance as he was denied the privilege of education at a first class school this is something very strange where religion becomes a problem while getting educated and pope had to undergo this as a boy pope was very determined to complete his schooling he read books at home like a boy gathering flowers in the fields just as they fell in his way it came very naturally to him his religion and his health were the two unfortunate factors which prevented him from entering business life or other professions pope could follow his inclinations because of his strong liking for literature and with his father's financial support his poetical rise and career is evident in the following couplet pope was a verse writer now let's look at this couplet as yet as a child nor yet a fool to fame i lisped in numbers for the numbers came this couplet indicates how naturally reading came to him at the tender age of 12 his first interaction with dryden another great literary figure transformed him to take a call on his career he displayed remarkable mastery in verse writing and his contribution as a verse writer was immense before he reached his 16th year the brilliant couplets and satires like the pastorals the essay on criticism the rape of the lock etc brought him great fame and also began to enjoy the elite company of joint figures literary figures including gay edison and swift pope's greatest gift to the world of augustan literature was his translation of homer's the iliad the first part of the iliad appeared in 1715 and the last part of the odyssey in 1725 though the translations of these great epics lacked the spirit of homer they were well received by the then literary world pope was not fortunate enough to have a charismatic and charming personality he suffered from physical weakness and was always in need of assistance his grit and determination and the sheer force of towering ambition helped him to create a significant place for himself in the world of literature and letters while he was translating homer he also published two poems they were the elegy to the memory of an unfortunate lady and the epistle of eloisa to abelard these two poems were instrumental in defining him as a poet but his last work an edition for shakespeare came in for invited criticism from lewis theobald a man of letters well this criticism did not go well with pope 
He was annoyed so much that he made Theobald the hero of his great satirical poem, The Dunciad. This was published in year 1728. And this book became the platform to take revenge on all his critics. About 100 contemporary writers were attacked through this satire that is the Dunciad. The final days of Pope's life were occupied with philosophical and critical poems, of which the most notable is the Essay on Man, which was published in, in the year 1733. Pope died in 1774 and was buried at Twickenham. He deserved to be buried in Westminster Abbey, but his religion played a villainous role and prevented him from getting the honour that he rightly deserved. Each age of literature has its own characteristic features. The poets and the writers of that particular age had to pass through this suffering or had to experience this suffering and Pope was one among them. Now let us look at the historical background of this great work of Pope called An Epistle to Dr. Arbuthnot. An Epistle to Dr. Arbuthnot now randomly called the prologue to the satires is an assortment of the satires wrought into one design. This poem basically written during the summer of 1734 was published in January 1735, less than two months before Arbuthnot's death that is between 1667 and 1735. The epistle is the result of a correspondence between Pope and his personal physician and lifelong friend Dr. Arbuthnot. Earlier, Dr. Arbuthnot cautioned Pope to be careful about the powerful individuals whom he had criticized. On August 25th, Pope replied. What was his reply? I determined to address to you in one of my epistles written by piecemeal many years and which I have now made haste to put together, wherein the question is stated, what were and are my motives of writing, the objections to them and my answers. Which means, he expresses his true intention and the very objective of writing this book titled an epistle to Dr. Arbuthnot. As Pope's letter would suggest, some of the passages were written earlier and some of them, example, the Atticus portrait published earlier. This part was originally sketched out in 1715 and was finally published in 1722 in the St. James Journal and was published in an elaborated form in 1727. Pope was under venomous attack for his satirical passages of another work called An Epistle to Lord Burlington and his first imitation of Horace and Dr. Arbuthnot was deeply anxious lest he should come to some physical harm from some of the enemies he had already made. In 1714, the political upheavals were ripe with the death of Queen Annie and Jacobite rebellion of 1715. Pope was a Catholic and there was a great expectation that he would support Jacobites, but no one knew with any certainty whom he did support. These events led to an immediate downturn in the fortunes of the Tories. England of Pope's time was an age of robust literary quarrels. Being a Tory, Pope penned an epistle to Dr. Arbuthnot at a time when the Tories had been out of power for 20 years. 
This epistle has been described as one of Pope's most striking achievements, a work of authentic power, both tragic and comic, as well as great formal ingenuity, despite the near chaos from which it emerged. Pope informs that he felt compelled to publish the poem to defend himself against the criticism of his persona, morals and his family by some persons of rank and fortune who were the authors of verses to the imitator of Horace and of an apostle to doctor of divinity from a nobleman at Hampton Court. Pope further clarifies that the very objective of writing this poem was to make his reader aware of how they were being misled by two authors of the above mentioned poems. Now throughout this epistle or throughout this great work of Pope, you can see how constantly Pope was defending himself against the criticism of his rivals or his contemporaries. He revealed truth through this poem to the literary circle and other admirers. His poem, he goes on to say, will attack only the venomous minds. Pope also mentions further that he has refrained from naming the persons in the further course of the poem. Well, this also indicates that Pope had soft corner for his shallow poetasters. Though he was criticized by them, he never wanted to scandalize their fame. In doing so, he acted upon the advice of Dr. Arbuthnot, whom this poem has been addressed. He begins the poem by expressing his displeasure at poetasters who approached him for his opinion on their poetic abilities. They were quite curious to get feedback from this great poet, that is Alexander Pope. They came with their unimpressive verses and he was never allowed to breathe free even on Sundays. They intrude upon his privacy in his grotto at his villa in Twickenham. Pope considers these poetasters appear insane. It's a queer group of a drunken priest, a sentimental woman, a peer, a lawyer and even a prisoner in jail. Well, these people wanted to become poets like Alexander Pope. This motley crowd of poetasters annoyed him to express his opinion on their immature verses. Some even went on to the extent of blaming his poems for the behavior of their sons and wives. Pope takes the help of Dr. Arbuthnot to keep the crowd of poetasters away from his door. Pope finds himself in a dilemma, his curt and frank opinions on the verses gained him several enemies. But his favorable opinions would force him to encourage the poetasters to read their boring verses to Pope endlessly. Often Pope gets into an indecisive mood and puts a grave face and advises them not to publish their verses for nine years. That was a kind of punishment for these upcoming poets. Another interesting point is three kinds of mediocre or poor poets or writers living in Drury Lane, an infamous locality in London, find a mention in Pope's poem. Well, one poet comes to Pope with a great hope for patronage and financial help of 10 pounds. He writes his verses when he is half asleep and is keen to publish them before the publishing season comes to an end. Another poet called Pitholian, who had once blamed Pope, but now changed his disposition to seek the help of Pope to recommend his friend who has written a drama under the title of the Virgin Queen. The dramatist requests Pope to recommend it to any theatre manager for stage show. If the play failed on the stage, its author would ask 
Pope to recommend it to the publisher Lintot and even promises a share of the money to him. Look at the kind of anxiety these poets have. Pope is annoyed with the shallow verses of some poetasters. Pope feels that it is important to publicize their names to escape from their torture. Dr. Arbuthnot advises Pope to restrain his temper and stop himself from scandalizing the so-called shallow poets. Despite his advice, Pope had ridiculed and slandered a large number of poets in his poem, Dunciad. But Pope assures uh, Dr. Arbuthnot that it is not an act of cruelty, as a stupid man is most insensitive to criticism and such a man's feelings are never hurt by adverse comments on his work. Pope whines that his unsympathetic criticism has hardly influenced the poetaster's attitude. There is no change. In spite of Pope's criticism, John Hilly continually delivers his silly sermons. Ambrose Philip continues to enjoy the favour of Bishop of Birmingham and a poetaster like Bavius continues to enjoy the hospitality of at least one household. Dr. Arbuthnot pleads Pope not to disclose the names of these poetasters. This will surely antagonize them and will be a great risk for him. But Pope replies that it is better to criticize those men and mention their names openly to flatter them. Flattery, says Pope, is more treacherous than open criticism. Pope then explains his sufferings in the hands of those psychophants. He is scared and admits that their flattery is more dangerous than their criticism. For instance, one flatterer compares Pope's manner of coughing to Horace's manner of coughing. Another compares Pope's nose to Ovid's nose. Another poetaster compares the way of holding his head to that of the ancient Roman poet Virgil. Then there are other poetasters who flatter Pope by comparing him to famous authors of ancient times. Pope next describes the different kinds of critics he has encountered. He does not categorize all the critics as insane or lunatics. He admits that some were quite sober. Pope smiles and accepts gracefully their immature, erroneous or right criticism. But most of these critics were merely studious and painstaking and they were lacking in spirit, taste and sense. Pope criticizes critics like Richard Bentley and Louis Theobald, whose names are associated with such great poets, Milton and Shakespeare. Bentley had edited Milton's Paradise Lost, while Theobald had edited Shakespeare's plays. Pope ignores and forgives the shallow-minded critics who were devoid of any real merit. Pope mentions Ambrose Phillips as a shallow poetaster who plagiarizes a number of Persian tales into English for meager income. Pope satirized all these poets as they were considered as very hollow by him. Pope's satirical attack does not augur well and it infuriates the poetasters. Even a man like Edison could not escape from the satirical attacks of Pope.
In the next passage, Pope gives a satirical character sketch of the famous writer Joseph Edison, who is nicknamed Atticus. Pomponius Atticus, a historical figure of ancient Rome, was a believer in the ideal of moderation and neutrality. By comparing Addison to Atticus is a compliment for the former one, but the satire here is that Edison did not stick to the noble ideals like Atticus. This modern Atticus, says Pope, has mastered the shrewd skill of pleasing his readers. But it is appalling that this man has become tainted with the faults and vices of mediocre poets. In the next passage, Pope gives us a character sketch of Buffo. Buffo is a name used for the patron who would take some poets under his patronage. Pope gives a negative picture of patrons of those times were fallacious as they were not sincere in extending their patronage to the poets whom they pretend to have favoured. Pope painted Bob Doddington and the Earl of Halifax while giving the character sketch of Buffo. They pretended to be patrons of those poets whom they have favoured. Poets seeking Buffo's patronage would eulogize in a hyperbolic language and in turn they were compelled to listen to his boring verses. A patron like Buffo does anything for a poet who is ready to campaign for him in the poetic world. But Pope is happy with these funny developments. He admits that he is indebted to such patrons because he is at peace away from troublesome poetasters. Apart from his physical deformity, he was a man of impulse. At times, he would be quick to shower his gratitude and generosity and in the next moment he would exhibit his negative emotions. His conceit and vanity would make him a mean and selfish person. He relies more on lies, though a bit of truth would sometimes be more convenient to him. Intent to path up previous blunders. Pope was governed by the instantaneous feeling. His emotion came in sudden jets and gushes instead of a continuous stream. The same peculiar quality of him deprives his poetry of continuous harmony and unity of conception. Now let us try to understand something about rhythm. This poem is an English heroic verse in iambic pentameter rhyming in pairs a, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, etc. It was a familiar words form from Chaucer's time onwards and was widely used by the Elizabethans, though their preference for blank words or more elaborate words forms prevented it from being generally popular. When we look at Pope's style, it is satirical and essentially poetical. It is poetical because of its imagination, quality, its vivid imagery and condensed style and of course his command on heroic couplet. His style is remarkable and by virtue of his excellent choice of words and skillful manner of combining words into happy and apt phrases, people find it very, very interesting. Poet perfects heroic couplets and gave them a delicacy of touch. He had the gifts of turning out numerous neatly worded epigrams. He possessed a complete and absolute mastery in the art of using this meter to express anything he wanted to say and nearly wrote all his work in it with an unsurpassed correctness. Famous for his use of the heroic couplet, he is the third most frequently quoted writer in the Oxford Dictionary of 
quotations after Shakespeare and Tennyson. Some of his familiar quotes serve to show his extraordinary power of condensed and happy phrasing. Now let us look at some popular quotes. Who shall decide when doctors disagree? Or a little learning is dangerous thing, to err is human, to forgive is divine. The proper study of mankind is man. And gentle dullness ever loves a joke, the right divine of kings to govern wrong. These quotes are pithy and brief. Themes This poem is an attack on Pope's critics and detractors and a defense of his own character and career. He expresses his intentions of writing this poetry. He uses every device of convincing language and puts his reasons logically and reasonably and also makes some emotional appeals to his professional foes. Well, the tone of the poem is a subtle one, neither uses complicated structures nor apply complicated figurative speech. The poem ends with an expression of goodwill by Pope for his friend Dr. Arbuthnot to whom this epistle is addressed and with an expression of his love and affection for his sick and aged mother. Pope appears to be dutiful and loving son and a sincere friend too. His expression of love towards his mother is pure and touching. The feeling of friendship too bears an authentic stamp. The concluding two lines are to be assumed as having been spoken by Dr. Arbutnot. As the title suggests, it is an epistle that means a letter written in the form of a poem and is also in the form of couplet. So, these couplets gained popularity through this great work of Alexander Pope. I hope you have enjoyed the uniqueness of this great letter which is presented in the form of a poem. Thank you.